good evening. God is a faithful God. Always, always faithful. And we just thank Him and want to love on Him and want to praise Him and just give Him the thanks that He is due. Amen tonight. Let's lift our Bibles and make our confession. This is my Bible. I can be what it says I can be. I can do what it says I can do. I'm about to receive the life-changing seed of the Word of God, and my life shall never be the same. Because I came to believe, and where I have need, I came to change, and the devil cannot stop me. By the help of God, I shall believe, I shall receive, and I shall be changed. Amen. Amen, amen. So, I am concluding uh, my portion of this series of teaching that we began some weeks ago, uh, maybe even months ago, on how to stay prepared and to avoid distractions in things and situations and circumstances. And my portion is how to stay prepared and to avoid distraction in personal struggles. So we started this teaching two weeks ago and we had a little break because of the, the, the weather. Uh, so I am going to um, review some to get us where we need to be so that we can continue with the remainder of this message. And so we talked about personal struggles, that those are things that we cannot avoid in life. And we said we cannot avoid personal struggles because, why? Because we are in this flesh and because we possess a soul. And we already know, all of us with bodies, we know that there are struggles in the body. There are struggles when it comes to um, the lust of the flesh. There are struggles when it just comes to the desires of the flesh. There, there, there are just so, so many things, so many things that can attack the body as well as the soul. So we know we have events and we have situations that come up in our life that causes uh, an attack, that causes an approach to our emotional side our hearts and so we know that in our hearts not only uh, uh, there dwells our thoughts there dwells our desires there dwells uh, our emotions and all of those things and because we have a body and because we have a soul when circumstances and things come up then of course it's going to apply it's going to uh, pull in those things. And so we talked about that. We talked about struggles, that a struggle is a fight. So we're talking about personal struggles, right? It's a fight, a fight. It's a battle. It's strenuous effort or work to shake off something, to shake loose something, to get away from something, to get out of something. That's a struggle. So I said, uh, you know, sometimes we go through things, circumstances, situation arises, we're able to maneuver past them where, you know, they don't affect us as much. But then there are some things that come up that affect our emotions, that if affect our bodies and our flesh. And then some of those things are just hard for us, some people, to shake off. And so we also said that Personal struggles can be caused or, if, or inflicted by a public or a communal event, such as COVID-19, that was a public and a communal event or a situation or circumstance. And then we have uh, events or situations that are common to every man, but they don't necessarily go through them at the same time. That they're common because they're just things that might happen in life, such as, uh, we, it's, such as marriage, such as having children, such as losing a job, such as uh, losing a loved one. Those are things that are common to every man. At some point, every man is going to go through something, a situation, a circumstance that every, uh, everyone else may not be going through at that time, but everyone is subject to it. So those are, are, are two general areas, two general areas of personal struggles and, then we, uh, uh, and the causes of personal struggles. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter, I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to 
go here first, 1 Peter chapter 5. And so I'd said that in the midst of events and situations, and if you were listening very closely to what Pastor Hill, uh, uh, well actually it was before the, I'm going to say before the lesson that she had planned, if that admonishment, that, that ministry, that, that teaching, it was a mini teaching that she did before you could hear and you could understand uh, this. All of this is laid, was laid out in what she said. It was laid out in what she said, because all of us at some point, we come to the point where we have to face death. That's one of, the, one of the circumstances, one of the events, and we're going to see that tonight as we walk through the book of Ruth, that, that one of those, that type of event, that can be a devastating thing for some people. And we said that although, uh, um, you know, you have this situation, sometimes it affects people differently and at different levels. And so uh, some, for some, uh, the death of a loved one might be extensive that so it may cause a, a, a struggle an emotional struggle that might be more extensive than someone else okay so we said that you know we're all going to go through it but then we also experience things differently and at different levels and so this is what, uh, th that's what she was talking about on, on, on Sunday. But what is, and I know I, somebody, somebody heard her say, that's why you got to be careful how you hear. Although she said, it's okay to cry. It's okay to go through that grieving process. We know that, and then for the, that grieving process might be longer for some than it is for others. But somebody, somebody heard her say, oh, she, I, she don't want us to grieve. She wants us to just push past, just push past, and, and just kind of forget about. She didn't say, she didn't say that. What she was saying was, is that you cannot allow the grief to overtake you, to overthrow you. You cannot allow the grief to cause you to forget about the purpose and the plan of God. That's all she was saying. In a nutshell, that's all she was saying. You have your moment. You have your moments. But in all of that, you never forget about the plan and the purpose of God. You don't allow those things to overtake you, to overthrow you. Because that is exactly what the enemy wants. He wants to uh, take that emotional event or that event that has caused some emo that has brought up some emotions in you, that has engaged your emotions, he wants to take that and he wants to use that against you, to devour you, to kill you and to destroy you. That is his goal. That is his goal. And so that's why it's important. That's why I said we need to look at our, we need to look at our struggles just a little bit differently. Look at them a little bit differently because a lot of times we, we think, and yes, it is happening to us, but what we have to remember, and I know it's difficult, but that's why you have the word, listen, I get it, and our pastor has said it all, all the time, you, you take the word, you hear the word, you have to make it yours quickly because something else has come, another word is coming, you have to make that quickly, but listen, that's why we, we have you taking notes. Because although we want you to get it and we want you to hold on to it, we already know that you're not going to be able to remember everything that is said. Because sometimes we give, like we give points, we give, we give ways to, this is how you do, and we give you steps and we give you things. We know you're not going to remember all of that step by step. That's why you write it down and that's why you can, you can hold on to it and you should. Because in those times, you remember, you remember enough. You remember enough. You, you remember a catchy phrase that was said at that time or something. You remember enough to know that word was taught. I remember that. Now I can go back and find it and then get, pull out those steps. So then I can apply it to this situation. So that is what, that's, that's why I said, you, I want you to look at your struggles differently. Because when you start to go through something, because again, we all going to go through. 
When you start to go through something, then you, ha you have enough word and you have enough knowledge. You've, you, have, you have retained enough where you can go back and say, okay, I know this was taught. Let me go back and see what those steps were so I can apply that to this situation. Oh, and I know sometimes that's difficult. That's difficult, right? So you're telling me that when I have a loved one to pass, you want me to go pull out some notes to help me through that? That's what you're telling me? That's exactly what I'm telling you. When you are grieving, as you go through, as you are crying, in the midst of your tears, I'm standing right here. I, I love that song. In the midst of my tears, I'm standing right here. I'm standing right here. And I'm going to go. When I get to the point where I can, remember I told you before, if you're not there yet, right, in that grief, and that, I told you to be still, don't respond, don't do nothing, just be still. Because you don't want to make any wrong choices, wrong decisions that's going to affect something else. You don't want to do that if you're just in the midst of your emotions. And that's, that's, that's all that you can see right there. Just be still. I understand. Just be still. But then when, you, when, when God has given you enough strength, when you, have, when you have thought your way through just enough, when you've pulled your way out just enough to say, okay, now I'm going to go get this word. I'm going to go get this word. And we're going to apply this word to this situation. Because God is faithful. Because God is faithful. First Peter chapter 5. Let's look at, start reading at verse 6. And the scripture reads, I'm sorry, I'm in 4. 5 and 6. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God. That's exactly what I was just saying. When you humble yourself under the mighty, it said the mighty hand of God. God is strong. He is mighty in battle. And so when you humble yourself, even in a struggle, you humble yourself. That means what? That means I need to not just grieve, but I need to allow the comforting of the Holy Ghost. I need to allow, I need to want to, and I need to allow God to come from me only as he can because he is mighty. Yes, we have people who try to comfort us and we, you know, all of that and that's good. But it's nothing like the comfort of the Lord. Because just as she said, when, when, the, when the time is there, you go through and you're going through the services, you do even a week, maybe even two weeks, maybe even three weeks after the funeral service, after the home going service, then you are there even at night, even the night, listen, even the night of the home going celebration. And you might be there by yourself. Everybody's going home. The repast is over. Everybody's going home and you're left there by yourself. Then all you can do is rely on the mighty hand of God. That's when you humble yourself. <laughs> you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And it says what? That he may exalt you in due time. He's going to lift you up. He is going to be the lifter of your head. But you got to humble yourself before him. You have to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Verse 7, casting all your care upon him. You got to cast all your care upon him. For he careth for you. <laughs> He's mighty and he cares. He's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above what you could ever ask or think. He cares for you and he wants you to come to him. He wants to hear your struggles. Not that he don't already know. He sees, yes, but he wants you to come to him. Your father. Your father who is mighty in battle, who cares for you. Oh, look, that is a recipe for some goodness. A recipe for some loving kindness. That's a recipe for some compassion. And that's what he wants. He wants you to come to him. And look, it says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, 
as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And that is why you have to humble yourself and allow God to do what he can do in your life and in your situation because the enemy is there and he's looking for the weak. He is looking for a way in. He is looking to use that situation to kill you and to destroy you. He would like nothing better for you to give up and give in. He would like nothing better. That's what he wants. Why? Because then he's trying to go against the plan and the will of God. He wants you to go against the plan and the will of God. He wants you to stop so that you won't be a part of the plan and the will of God. He wants you to stop so that God cannot work through you to do whatever it is that he needs for you to do and only you can do. The assignment that he has given you, God is trying to stop it. He's trying to stop it. And so that's why we got to look at our struggles a little differently. Those struggles, remember I told you, they are not just for you. You go through because it's going to strengthen you. But as you go through, and we're going to see uh, in, uh, uh, with Naomi, as you go through, those who are around you who witness, those who are around you who see, they're able to witness, they're able to experience and then that builds the strength and the faith in others. So look, look, verse nine. Whom resist, resist, resist steadfast in the faith. Remember I told you that you don't have to fight. That God has already fought your battles and the battle is already won. We know that God has already taken, that Jesus took, took the keys to death, hell, and the grave. He took the keys. So you don't have to fight. The battle is already won. All the, the only thing that you have to do is what? Stand in faith. Stand in trust and confidence in God. You stand firm, feet firmly planted, set established right there and you don't move from that you're crying at night that's a bend <laughs> oh you didn't get that you're crying at night it's a bend but those feet are firmly planted they're not being uprooted you're not moving from the faith The roar of the lion is just a bend. His roar is bigger than his bite. His roar is bigger than his bite. You have to allow the bite. Oh, you didn't get that. What did they say about him? When you come up against an animal, what do they normally what they tell you to do? Stand, just be still. <laughs> just stand and be still. I know that's hard to do. A lion come toward you, you're gonna stand and be still. I can get it. I get it. But in this case, that's all you gotta do. You stand, and then what do they do? When you stand, they see you standing there, be still, they moving on to something else. Oh, because that's I don't know what that is. I don't know who that is. You stand and resist the devil and watch him flee. He gonna, he gonna move. <laughs> He's gonna leave. That's all you gotta do. His roar is bigger than his bite and you have to allow the bite. See, when you, up, up, when you uproot your feet and you start moving around, then that's when he's coming after you even more. And then he's going to get you. Th then there comes the bite. Because this is a live one. Oh, this is a live one. This one I can get. Because you're running. Don't run. Remember I told you, don't run. Just stand still. 
Be still and know that God is God. <laughs> Be still and know that God, he is God. And he is God alone. And yes, you might be hurting now, but God is faithful. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and watch him lift and exalt you in due time. Watch him lift and exalt you in due time. And he is faithful to do it. He is faithful to do it. It says to be sober. Verse, uh, uh, um, yeah, oh, knowing whom resist is steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions, the same things that you have, are going through, somebody else has already gone through it before, somebody else is going to go through it after you. He says the afflictions are accomplished. That means they are complete. They are finished in your brethren that are in the world. They are in the world just like you, experiencing the same things just like you. But just as those things are accomplished in them, those afflictions are accomplished and complete in them, know and trust that it is going. That, that's how God works. It says, verse 10, but the grace, but, but the God of all grace who hath called us, uh, called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, <laughs> he says, after you have suffered, that means we're going to suffer something. After you have suffered a while, he make you perfect, established, strengthened. Settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That's some good news. Humble yourself knowing that you can cast your cares. You should cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. And be sober and be vigilant. Remember what we talked about. Being sober. That means being calm and collected in your spirit. That means that when those emotions, that means don't respond out of those emotions. I'm sober. Yes, I have the emotions, but I'm not responding out of that. I'm going to be calm and I'm going to be collected in spirit. I'm going to be calm and collected in spirit. And I'm going to be vigilant because I understand that the enemy is only trying to kill, steal, and destroy. I'm going to be attentive. I know, I see that this is the work of the enemy. So I need to be awake and attentive so that I can see it. Even in the midst of what you're going through, see your struggles differently. This is what I'm talking about. See them differently. You have to see your struggle as the enemy trying to destroy you. That's the way you need to see it. That'll help pull you out. Not only is he trying to destroy me, he's trying to pull me away from the purpose and the plan of God. I need to remind myself that I have the words. Well, a pastor said, I have the word. The word is in me. I'm going to go pull it out. I have the word. I have the word. I have the very spirit of the living God living on the inside of me. I understand that the enemy is trying to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But I have the word of God. And I am going to stand in that word. I'm going to apply that word. And I'm just going to ride it out. I'm going to ride it out. And I'm going to keep my feet planted firmly. See your struggles differently you got to see them differently God's grace is able remember we talked about uh, when you are distracted when there is distraction because of a personal struggle there is anxiety there's preoccupation with the outcome or the end result you're preoccupied you have anxiety about what's going to happen about how this is going to end we said that there's disruption. That means that there's an interference in your trust and in your confidence in God. When you are distracted, there is a disruption. There's some interference in your trust and confidence in God when you're distracted. There is interruption. There's a disconnect in your intimacy with God. See, when we're distracted, we tend to pray less. When we're distracted, we tend to not read our Bibles when we're distracted. Sometimes when we're distracted, we don't even come to church. 
There's a disconnect. There's an interruption in your intimacy and your communication with God because of distraction. And then the fourth one was when there is distraction, there is confusion about what you should do and how you should proceed. You're not thinking clearly. So then I said what? I said sober, being sober and vigilant, vigilant, you have to be sober and vigilant before the struggle. You have to be sober and vigilant, vigilant during the struggle, which means what? You have to be sober and vigilant all the time. You have no room for insobriety. No room. Being sober just means that I'm thinking clearly. Nothing, nothing is distracting my thought pattern. I'm thinking clearly and I'm being vigilant. That means that, that I, I, I'm going to stay right there, that I'm being cautious, that I'm, 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 I'm watchful, I'm watching. You have to be sober and vigilant at all times. Then I said, this is how you avoid being distracted. And we, when we finish, get, uh, get through these little points, we're going to go on and we're going to look at Ruth and, and, and this family. Bring this all home for you. So we said, that this is how that you avoid being distracted during your personal struggles. Number one, that you understand that the cause of your struggle, the cause of your struggle, the situation, whatever it is, it may just be for a season. We went to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. We, we talked about that. I'm not a, uh, based on time, I won't be able to go. But and we've read that scripture plenty of times, so we know. There's a season for this, there's a season for that. Time to, to live, there's a time to die. Time to be born, there's a time to die. We, so we already know that. Understand that your seasons, that the cause of your struggle may just be for a season. Sometimes it's the length of that, that, the length of that season may depend on your actions and your responses. We talked about that. Sometimes the length of that season may be based on your response, your actions. And then we said that in all seasons, regardless of what season you're going through, in all seasons you must endure and you must ride it out. Whatever the season, endure and ride it out. But you can do that, right? Because we already said in 1 Peter chapter 5, you can humble yourself, cast all your cares, and watch him work because he's going to exalt you in due time. Then we said, number two, you need to maintain your trust in the one who can keep you in every season. Maintain your trust in the one who can keep you in every season. We, we went to Psalms 91. He who dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall it abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say he is my refuge. He is my refuge. So we, we are going to maintain our trust in the one who can keep us in every season. And then I said we need to maintain our commitment to God and our righteous resolve. Whatever it is. Because again, the enemy is trying to pull you away. So yeah, he's going, he's going to bring up things. He's going to put things before you that's going to want you to, put, to, to, to do things and to say things that are out of your godly character. He's going to do things, he's going to say things that's going to appeal to the lust of your flesh. He's going to do things and, and, say, and have you say things that's going to go against the, uh, uh, using your emotions, that's going to go against what you should be saying instead of saying things in love the way God has intended and asked us to communicate. He's going to do all of that. So we got to maintain our resolve to be righteous. That's maintaining your commitment to God in whatever it is. I'm maintaining my commitment to God. I'm maintaining my righteous resolve. And then that means being single-minded and determination. Being single-minded and determined. That means it's not open for discussion. It's not open, because you know, people can tell you a lot of things. They're going to give you a lot of advice, when, especially when you're going through something. Everybody got, a, everybody got an opinion. 
about what you should and should not be doing. I'm maintaining my righteous resolve. In COVID-19, if I lost my job, I'm maintaining my righteous, my, my, uh, righteous indignation. I'm maintaining my commitment to God because whatever it is that I get, that's not going to keep me from giving offering. See, a person who is struggling paying their bills, they might say, well, I can't give an offering. Oh, I know, it got quiet. I'm struggling to pay my bills, but I'm giving my money to the church. No. You're struggling to pay your bills, and I'm maintaining my commitment to God to give to him. Because my offering is to him. The almighty one with the mighty hand who will exalt me in due time if I humble myself before him. Humbling myself before him, that means I'm going to give my offering because that's what, that's humbling myself before the hand of the Lord. You see how that works? And I know sometimes it's difficult to think about. But if I get, if I get, if, if, the, if, God, if someone bless me, I've lost my job, you know, and I, I may go, and I have some savings or whatever. Somebody gives me some money because they, they know, I may not even know. Uh, you know, a portion is going to go to my bills, a portion is going to go to my offering. Because I'm maintaining my righteous resolve. That's a righteous resolve. But that's a resolution that you have to come up with on your own. It can be taught, but you, it has to be something that you resolve in your own heart. And then I'm going to continue. So maintain my commitment to God. And that fourth one was, is I'm going to continue with evidence of faith. Continue with evidence of faith. In my struggle, I'm going to continue with evidence of faith. This is how I avoid being distracted. Prayer is evidence of my faith. I have not lost my faith in God. I'm holding on to that. Prayer and, being, and, and demonstrating my faith, demonstrating faith that promotes faith. <clears throat> demonstrating faith that promotes faith. Because it's not all about you thinking about my struggles differently. Yes, I'm going through it, but this is not all about me. I know that's hard because you're going through it. And you think that you're the only one going through it sometimes. And you think, when am I going to get out? And you're thinking all of these things, all of those things, they will cause you to be distracted from what God is doing. And from what God wants to do in you and through you. And that distraction will cause you not to humble yourself before God. We're going to see that when we look at Elimelech. Allowing his struggles. He had his, he had, it's all about me. It's all about me and my family. But what is God doing? He didn't think about that. He didn't think about that. So those were the four. Those are how you do avoid. Now, let's dig into Ruth. Turn to Ruth chapter 1. Ruth chapter 1. We're going to do some skipping around and we're going to just follow me, just flow with what we're doing here. So I told you that my, my purpose was just to look and use as an example Ruth. But as I was, I was uh, studying Ruth, God started showing me something in all of these people that were even surrounding Ruth. So here we go. We're going to start with Elimelech. Verse chapter 1, Ruth 1, verse 1. 
Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judea, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, uh, Malone, Milan, and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judea. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. So what was the event? So we're going to talk about these uh, people. In, uh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, um, recognize that we're going to see their event. And then we're going to see their actions and their responses. We're going to do that for all of these. So for Elimelech, his event or situation was the famine. It was the drought in the land of Bethlehem of Judea. That was the event, the situation that came up. Now, remember, that was a communal. It was a public. It affected everybody in the land, right? But this is how, this is how, and, and listen, Bethlehem, listen to this. Bethlehem, it signifies, it means the house of bread. Bethlehem means the house of bread. But now we're experiencing famine and drought in the land. Okay? There was scarcity. There was scarcity there to correct. We believe that God was doing something in their midst. There was a scarcity to correct and restrain the luxuries. The luxury and the wantonness of those that dwell there. You know, God doesn't do, God does things on purpose. The land was always called the house of bread, but yet we see this scarcity. God is doing something. God is doing something. He never meant for it to remain that way. He was doing something. But Elimelech, he didn't see that. He didn't see that. So the first opportunity he had to get away from that place he went. He was, listen, the only thing he was looking at was this scarcity, this famine, this drought. How am I going to take care of my family? And God knows you need to take care of your family. How am I going to take care of my family? But not once did he think about what is God doing in this place? What's the purpose behind it? See your struggles differently. When there is a struggle, you need to ask what's the purpose behind it? You need to ask, what is God doing? Look at your struggles differently. He wasn't sober-minded because his thoughts were only on that famine, what he was lacking in taking care of his family. He was discontent and he had an unstable spirit. He was, at that point, he wasn't communicating with God because God wouldn't have told him to leave Bethlehem, the house of bread. He wouldn't have told him. He didn't remember that seasons are in the hands of God. <laughs> this place is called the house of bread. And yes, we're going through some scarcity now, but guess what? I believe and I trust in God that he is going to see us through every season. He's going to see us through every season. And that the season is in the hand of God. He jumped out of the hand of God. He jumped out of the hand of God and he went to a land and took his family. Not only did he go, he, took, he went and he took his family out of the hand of God. He didn't seek God's will. He did what was right in his own eyes. Remember, this is coming out of Judges. And in Judges, they said that at that time, during those times, the people did as they saw fit and saw right in their own eyes. Elimelech, that's exactly what he was doing. He was doing what was right in his own eyes, moving his family. Listen, your decisions, 
And that's why it's important not to make emotional decisions. That's why it's, it's, it's time. I told you to be still until you're able to make some sound decisions that are based on the word and the plan and the will of God. Because his decisions and his actions led his sons into another situation. They led, he led his sons into another situation. Our actions and our responses, whether good or bad, whether righteous or unrighteous, during our personal struggles is witnessed by others and it impacts others' lives. So now we're going to flow and we're going to see how his decision impact, and impacted his sons' lives. Look at verse 3. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, no, 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 we don't want to do that. Verse, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And Elimelech, yes, we do. And, and Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left and her two sons. So now we see the husbands died and she's there with her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Oprah, Orpah and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwell there about 10 years. Well, what you have to know, and I don't have time to, to really dig into this deeply, but I'm going to give you some scriptures. The Moabites, the Moabite women, they were, they were not supposed to. The, uh, Elimelech and his, his family, they were from Bethlehem. They were Christian. They were believers. They were well, not believers at that time because, you know. But they, they were God's people. They had accepted God in the knowledge that they had of him. They had accepted him. They were not supposed to intertwine and intermingle with the Moabites. And so for that scripture, again, I'm not going to have time to go there, but they married Moabite women, which was forbidden under the law of Moses. And you can find that in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and, um, and chapter 23. Deuteronomy 7 and 3, uh, Deuteronomy 23 and 3. So they were forbidden to marry more by women, but they did, okay? So now we see that the event or the situation that they were put in is being, being sent, being taken to a place that they should not have been taken to, to first, in the first place. And so, and, and to dwell with the Moabites. So now they're dwelling with Moabites and all they see are these Moabite women. Oh, here we go. Now they see the Moabite women. Perhaps they lost their focus because they were distracted by the death of their father. Perhaps. Perhaps that's what it was. But they took their minds off and they lost sight of the law of God. The law was already presented. You do not entangle with the Moabites and the Moabite women. You don't take a Moabite wife. It was already established. But they took their sight off the law, law of God. They were not sober. They were not sober. There was intention on returning to Bethlehem. They could have waited to find a wife. When they got back to Bethlehem, they could have waited. They could have went back. But no, they saw these Moabite women. Oh, the Moabite women. And they just had to have one. Distracted by the lust of the eyes, <laughs> the lust of the flesh. They had flesh. There's always trouble in the flesh. So now we see that Elimelech took his family from a land where he should not have taken them from. Now he's put his sons in this position. Now they still had to choose. Remember I said they could have, because he was gone at that point. They, but, but he introduced them, put them in a place that they should not have been put into. Naomi. Let's look at Naomi. Verse 5. And Milan and Chilion died also, both of them, and the women was left of her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. So she heard all the way in Moab. 
She heard of the goodness of God. She heard of the mercies of God all the way in Moab that he was doing in Bethlehem, which was her home country. So, and, and there, so she felt, she felt, oh, look, at, look at verse 20, jump down to verse 20. One and 20, it says, and she said to them, so when she heard, so they went, and in verse 20 it says, and she said unto them, the people that were coming up to her, those Bethlehem, those uh, Bethlehem knights that were coming uh, unto her, call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dwelt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? So here we see that there was some bitterness that had set in. There was some bitterness that had set in. Okay, so we see the event that in situation that had come up was the death of her spouse and the death of her children. So now we have bitterness that has set in. Remember that the enemy will always try to use your emotions, right? Will always try to use your emotions. But one thing that, one thing about, about, about uh, uh, Naomi is that sometimes we get to this, uh, this part. So there, there, see, there are some of us who when we go through and our emotions, you know, kick in, then we are able to do what I was talking about earlier. We're able to stop. We're able to, you know, we, we, we know we know not to respond. We know not to react. We know, we know to just be still and let's, you know, let's work, let's work this process out. But then there's sometimes when we have those who they still know, Naomi still know the word. We still, we're going to see that. She always, she still know, knew the word. But at some point, at some point, she got, she, she got a little intoxicated. That bitterness kind of intoxicated her a little bit. So, so, then she, so, so now she's thinking about, okay, now in her mind, the Lord has forsaken me. In, in, in her mind, you know, so she had those thoughts because she didn't know where her life was going. She was having a difficult time with that. But remember when she heard, when she heard, when she heard that God was doing something in, in Bethlehem, she decided that she needed to get back. When she heard that the Lord had visited, it said, when she heard the Lord had visited, so, so she had the word in her. She had the word in her. That's why still it's important. That's why I say it's important that you not say nothing and you not be still because we don't want to see your bitterness. So she should have just, just kept quiet, right? But so we don't want to see that bitterness. So, so this happened, okay? But we're going to see in, in verse, uh, let's see. Oh, Lord, let's, go to, let's go to chapter three real quick. Ruth chapter three. Let's look at this. We, we're going to see that, that she still had the word and, and she, she, was still, she was still there. She still, her feet were planted. Don't remember, she, she was bending a little bit. She was probably bending a little bit more than what she should have been. But it's okay. In, verse, in, in chapter 3, let's look at verse, at verse 1. It says, then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, she's talking, talking uh, about Ruth, my daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee that it may be well with thee? And now is not Boaz of our kindred with whose maidens, whose wast? Behold, he winnoweth barley tonight in the, in the threshing floor. Wash thyself, therefore, and anoint thee, and put thy raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the floor, but make not thyself known unto the men. So let me, let me because I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time, let me, let me tell you what's, what's happening here. So we know about uh, 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 the story about the, the kinsman redeemer, right? So the, the, the husband dies, and so if there's not anyone, and the sons were dead, so there was not an, another male, another man to, to be able to, uh, to get the, the inheritance that was for the family and all of that. So she remembered enough to remember the law. See, that's why I said the, the, the law and the word was not far from her heart. Okay, she had a lot of bitterness to set in for a little while, but it, she had not gone too far off. Well, she did not remember the hand of God. She did not remember or did not forget the hand of God and she did not forget the law of God. So we see that. So you see, this is what I'm saying, that we always have to remember, always, you always have, when you hide the word in your heart, when you practice the word, then although, as I said, although you may bend, although you may, you will never be far from it. Never far from God. You won't ever be far from him. 
So we see, we see that here. She aligned. She aligned. So although she had this bitterness, she remembered the law of God and she took action by giving counsel and instruction to Ruth on what to do regarding this kinsman law. But you see, again, you have to be sober and you have to be vigilant to be able to see that. We have to tie, listen, we have to tie, unlike Elimelech, you have to tie your circumstances around the word of God. You don't tie the word of God around your circumstances. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Because sometimes we can look at a situation like Elimelech. All he thought about was provide for my family. And yes, that is word. But he, did, he took his mind, so instead of doing that, again, he should have taken the word of God use his situation and say, okay, in this situation, what is it? That's how you tie the word around that situation. I'm taking my circumstances. I'm giving it to the Lord. Now, how do I apply the word? Did you get that? You got to be careful. You have to be careful in how you do. Be careful in how you react. Be careful in how you respond. Using the word appropriately. Appropriate. We're talking about appropriately using the word. Remember, you, you can use the word for anything that you want. You can use the word for whatever it is that you want, even to go against the word of God. Because we find things and we try to connect things and we just try to hold this one scripture where we're not considering everything else. People do that all the time. They do it all the time. And they want to try to justify their actions and their responses based on this scripture. This one right here. This one right here. What about, what about these other pages? No, no, no. This one right here. We could all do that if we wanted to. That's what I mean. And then she showed evidence. How do we know that she showed evidence? When we talked about that, that demonstrating faith that produces faith, right? So look at, look at, at go, go back to, to Chapter 1, let's look at verse 8. Chapter 1, verse 8. And Naomi said unto her daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. She prayed for them. That was her prayer for them, is that God would deal with her. Remembering the way that she had dealt with her, her children, their, their husbands, and her. So she, she, didn't, she didn't lack prayer. She didn't lack prayer. And then let's look at verse 14. What was the other thing I said? I said, prayer is evidence, demonstrating uh, faith. And then I said, what? Demonstrating faith by showing your faith, somebody experiencing your faith. That's how you can demonstrate faith. So in verse 14, 1 and 14, look at, look at <laughs> verse 14. And they lifted up their voices and wept. So we're talking about Naomi and Apporah lifted up their voices and wept again. And Apora kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee. 
or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Let me show, let me show you something. So we have Apora and we have Ruth, who were both with Ruth, understanding that they were a family who believed God, who trusted God, believed God. They were, you know, they made some mistakes, but they believed God. And so they had experienced that. Apur and Naomi they, uh, and Ruth, they had experienced that being with them for all of those 10 years. And so here we see that Ruth has made a righteous result. The, 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 the trust and the faith that she saw in Naomi caused her. The other one left. They were both being taught the same thing. They were both witnessing the same thing. But we see here that it produced something in Ruth that evidently did not, was not produced in a poor. Something took place. Her faith promoted and encouraged faith in Ruth. And her faith promoted a determined and a wholehearted and a serious faith in Ruth. For just a minute. Just a minute, because that's all I want to spend on the poor. The only thing I want you to see is that she left. There are certain cares and troubles that come along with being widowed. Extras, we know that, especially with young women. So there are cares and there are considerations that happen when a woman is a, a young woman is widowed. We know that. And so uh, here we see that Apora, we think she thought about those cares and those troubles and those considerations, and she decided she was going to return home to her people. I don't know, because remember, a, a, a Naomi started saying, you know, do I have other children and other uh, boys in my body? Do I have other sons in my body that you're going to wait for them? Do, she don't know. She don't know what's going on. She don't know what's going to happen. But she know I can stay right here with these men, <laughs> these men folk right here, and I'm going to be just fine. So forget about everything else. That was what her mind was on. She was considering those cares, those troubles, those considerations, and she decided she was going to return home to her people. It hadn't become a struggle for her yet, but she was already in anticipation of the struggle. She was already anticipating, oh, this is going to be a problem. So she stayed. Now let's talk about Ruth. The event, her, her, her in a poor, remember we said, it can be so, you can have the same situation. And then you have two people who handle it very differently. So we have Apora who couldn't take it. No, no, no. I'm going to stay right here. I'm you go on. I'm going to stay right here. But then we had Ruth. Ruth. She decided that she was going to dwell in the secret place of the Most High. I want you to see this one. Psalms 36. I want you to see this in Psalms 36. I love this. And let's look at verse uh, 36. Let's look at verse 7. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house. Ruth made a resolve that it was better to be, because remember she was a Moab. A Moabite, right? Those were people who were not supposed to be da 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 da, and so she was not a she was not a believer. She was not a Christian. She was not a a a, a, a person of God, a people of God, until she met Naomi and that that her that family. So she had made in her resolve. She made a resolve that it is better that she that there was an abundant satisfaction in. God's house in God's house and thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures for with thee is the fountain of life in thy light shall we see light this is the resolve that Ruth made this is the resolve that she made that if anybody could bring life to that situation but what she was able to produce that faith 
was able to be produced in her by what she saw in Ruth. What she was taught by Ruth. And she clung to that. Remember what I said. I said when you get knowledge, you obtain the knowledge, you have to retain the knowledge, and then you have to apply the knowledge. You obtain, you retain, and then you apply. And this is what she was doing. Her actions, go back to chapter one, Ruth one. And I got a few seconds, so. Ruth chapter one. And let's look at verse 14 and 16. We're just going to sing. We're going to end. We're going to end with this because this is, this is what we need to sing. That she had single, she was, had a single-minded determination. Nothing was open for discussion. Single-minded determination. Her identity was with God and with God's people. And that was her resolve, to follow God and to cling to his people. Oh, get that. Her resolve, during her struggle, her resolve was to identify with God and to identify with God's people her resolve was to follow God and to cling to his people that tells you when you are going through something you don't run away you need to cling cling to God's people uh, verse 14 and they lifted up chapter 1 verse 4 and they lifted up their voice and wept and again and Apora kissed her mother-in-law but Ruth clave unto her and she said behold thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods return thou unto the, thy sister-in-law and Ruth said entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee for with, whither thou goest I will go and where thy lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my your, uh, thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. She had made up in her mind. There was no discussion. She said, "Entreat me not to leave you." She had made up in her mind that no matter where Ruth, uh, Naomi went because of the God that was in her and the God that she had seen and what she had experienced, she says, I am not going to leave that. I see the hand of God at work. I can see that. She experienced that and she saw that and she was not going to allow anything, not a struggle, not a situation, not an event, not any circumstances, nothing was going to separate her from God and God's people. And I am out of time. Remember to look at your struggles differently. Look at them differently. Because we see here that Naomi's, in, in, in Naomi's struggle, the faith that she demonstrated, although she showed a little bitterness, the faith that she demonstrated, it was able to help produce faith in Ruth. Because she experienced it. She saw it firsthand. She witnessed it. And like I said, what we go through is not always about us. It's never, it's not, it's never, well, I'm not going to say it's never about us. Part of it is about us because that helps build our faith too when we get to the other side of struggles. It helps build our faith when we get to the other side of, 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 of situations, when we see the hand of God and how he brings. So, so yes, in that, in, that, in that sense, it does, it does something for you. But it's not just for you. Because remember, I told you that your testimony, your witness, your testimony is for somebody. Your testimony is not for you. Your testimony is for somebody else. Testimony is not for you. So we get happy because we can testify about the Lord bringing us out. And that's good. But remember, it's not for you. Your, your testimony is for somebody else. Amen? Stand to your feet. So when you're going through, when you're going through, you got to keep, and remember, don't, don't, the, your notes, keep them near and dear. We know, we know, we know. We're not going to remember all of that. We're not going to remember all those steps. We're not going to remember when she said this, she said that, she said that, to, to stay out of this. And it's, now, and now you, you had that word on Sunday. You got this word. You're going to have another word. We know. That's why you got to keep your notes dear and near. Still get it in your heart. You get the gist of it in your heart. 
the gist of what's being said. That's what you, that's what you, you got that, because you have to have something to recall, right? Oh, I remember pastor taught on death. I remember, I remember how I was blessed by it. If nothing else, I remember how I was blessed by it. Let me go pull out those notes, because I don't remember everything you said. So when you have a struggle, that's the thought pattern. That's what you need to be thinking. That's the way you need to be thinking instead of waddling. We don't want to waddle in self-pity. We don't want to waddle in self-pity. Who wants to be hurt? That's not a good feeling. That's, you know, nobody wants to be, you shouldn't want to be, nobody wants to, to feel down. That's a, nobody wants to feel heaviness. It happens and it comes, why? We already said it, because of the flesh and because of our emotions. We know it's going to come, but we don't want to do. We don't want to waddle in that. We want to get to the other side. Amen. Lift your hands, most gracious God. We want to say thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the word that you have prepared, the table that you have set before us. We thank you for the opportunity to, to be able to feast on your word. We thank you, Lord God, that your word is cleansing, that your word is powerful, that your word is strengthening, that your word cleanses, that your word just helps. It helps in every regard, in every situation. It is a light, a light unto our feet, a light unto our paths, Lord God. It makes our crooked ways straight. It make our, makes our paths straight, Lord God. And we want to say thank you that you've given us your word, that you will put us in a place to help put us in a, into a place. As we hear, as we receive, as we, are, uh, as we retain, as we apply your word, we know that your word does not return to you, Lord, and that you oversee the performance of your word. That is what we're excited about, that you oversee the performance of your word. As we hold on to it and trust it and apply it, you will see the over, you will see over the performance of your word to work in us and through us and around us as you please, as you will, as you purpose based on your plan. And we are so ever grateful that we can humble ourselves under the hand of the Almighty. We thank you that we can humble ourselves under the hand of the Almighty. We can dwell in that secret place of the Most High. We can dwell under the shadow of the Almighty's wings. And for that we say thank you, Lord. That even in the midst of our tears, in the midst of in the things that we go through, in the midst of those situations and those circumstances, we can dwell in that secret place of the Most High. We can abide under the shadow of the Almighty God and you will be our refuge. You are our refuge, our tower of refuge and strength. And we thank you, Lord. We just glorify you and we praise your name forevermore. And as we leave this place, departing from this place and to our different destinations, we thank you for your hand of protection. We pray, dear God, that you would get us safely to our destinations and that you would bring us safely back on Sunday. And it is in the mighty and the precious name of Jesus, the powerful and the matchless name of Jesus, that we pray this prayer. Amen.